So I'm wondering, are there any cavers in the congregation this morning? Any spelunkers amongst us? Have any of you all been to the, uh, the inner space caverns there off of 135 in Georgetown? Yeah, I see a few hands. So I've always wanted to go to the inner space caverns. I love caves. I love the breathtaking beauty that is right below our feet. I love the way the stalactites and the stalagmites form over hundreds of thousands of years. And seeing these formations, it fills me with wonder and awe of how such grandeur is created from small drops of water seeping through cracks in the stone over many, many, many centuries. Fun fact, I actually got married. Uh, we had a special cave ceremony. That's me and my wife jumping the broom back at the Spanish treasure cave uh, in northwest Arkansas. So you can imagine, I've always wanted to uh, go exploring in, in the inner city, uh, inner space caverns. Uh, the amazing thing about these caverns is that they didn't even know that they existed until they were surveying for I-35, and they were boring holes down to make sure that the structure would support that highway. So they bored a hole, and can you imagine coming down this hole? Now, there wasn't a ladder there at the time. They actually just lowered a man down into this hole, into the pitch black, to see what was there. And I can't imagine his surprise when these amazing cathedral rooms spread out for literally miles in these caverns. So over Thanksgiving, I finally got the opportunity to go to the inner space cavern with my family that were visiting from Berlin. We all went out there, and I don't know if you've ever been on a cave tour, but there's this moment when you get down into the depths of the cave where there isn't any light and the guide kind of gathers everybody around and they have the kids hold on to the hands of their parents and they turn out the lights and it's pitch black and silent. You can't even see the hand in front of your face. And this little kid who kind of wriggled away from the hand of his parent, he goes, hey, someone turn on the lights. <laughs> you know, Someone turn on the lights. You can't really blame a little kid when you're thrust into the darkness like that. You don't know where your parents are. Of course, it's a reasonable thing to say. Somebody turn on the lights. Because the darkness is disorienting. Because there's nowhere to get your bearings. It's isolating because you cannot see those around you. And it's scary because you could get lost. Someone turn on the lights. As the glow of Christmas fades and our celebrations come to an end, the darkness of our world can come crashing in as we are reminded of the ongoing destruction of war, the continued devastation of creation, as we struggle against injustice and iniquity, as we confront loss and grief, pain, illness, loneliness, doubt, as we begin this new year, I can't help but wonder, isn't that what we all really need? Isn't that what the world needs? Isn't that what I need? For someone to turn on the lights, for evil and corruption, for warfare and pain, for everything that brings despair to be flooded with light. Someone turn on the lights to vanquish viral disease. Someone turn on the lights to reconcile hostility. Someone turn on the lights to help the lost find their way. Someone turn on the lights. Well, the Gospel of John begins with this yearning, this great need in our hearts and in the world around us. John's Gospel doesn't introduce Jesus with angels or shepherds. There's no manger. There's no star. No, John's gospel begins with an announcement of the human condition, darkness, and Jesus' place in God's grand plan of redemption to bring light to the world. So here now, the beginning of John's gospel. Oh, that's not it. You'll need to pull that up over there. Thank you. Nope. Nope. All right. 
I'm going to read it to you, and you're going to have to just uh, listen like the old, old days. <laughs> listen for God's word for you. In the beginning, there was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overtake it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light, the true light which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of light, God of beauty, God of surprises, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts reveal your word in unexpected places in our lives and in our world. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, in the beginning, there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This poetry in the prologue of John takes us all the way back to the beginning, hearkening the very first verses of Hebrew Scripture in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. It is intended to remind John's Jewish audience that this is the same word of God that spoke to Moses on the mountaintop, the word of the law and the covenant with God's people, the same word of God that compels the prophets to speak truth to power and hope for restoration. It is the same word that the psalmist proclaims is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, the same word by which God brings creation into existence, saying, let there be light. This word, John calls logos. Now, Greek in Greek, logos means much more than simply a word. It's more broadly something that is expressed or brought into fruition. It's a, a word or thought that's made into being. But logos also in Greek means wisdom. Wisdom that's personified in the Hebrew scripture as Sophia in Greek or Chokma in Hebrew. In fact, wisdom says in Proverbs, I can get this one, yeah. When God established the heavens, I was there. When God drew a circle on the face of the deep, when God made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker. And I was daily his delight, playing before him always, and delighting in the human race. This description is echoed in John's gospel, when he says all things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light for all people. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overtake it. And the darkness does not overtake it. What an audacious statement for John's audience to hear. The community of John had been through a lot of darkness, a lot of trauma. They still waited for Jesus' return amidst the ruins of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple and the persecution of their movement. Where was this light in the darkness? We might ask the same today. In the darkness of war, of injustice, of brokenness, of grief, where is this light? Someone turn on the light. Well, in the pitch black of that inner space cavern, the guide responded to this request by turning on a flashlight and pointing it to the rock of a cave. The fluorescent rocks glow with an inner light, allowing our guide to draw this little smiling face on the, in, in, that, on the wall that was immersed in darkness. It was a light that could only really be seen in that pitch black, 
that light coming back out of the rock. New Testament scholar and preacher Robert Kassar notes that the prologue of John never claims the darkness uh, succumbs to the light, only that the light goes on shining amid the darkness, and that the darkness does not overcome it or master it. The author knew that we are a people in darkness, but a people too who claim that there is a light, a people not rescued from darkness, but given a glimmer of light. We are in a season of epiphany. It's a season of recognition and a season of celebration of Emmanuel, God with us, lighting our broken world like the light on that cave wall. Epiphany is also an aha moment, a, a moment when we're surprised by that presence of God even in that darkness. It's a season of celebration and a season of revelation. And on this first day of the new year, 2023 stretches ahead of us, busting up with possibilities and with crisis, with hope and with conflict. And truthfully, we cannot know what the next 365 days might hold. But as people of faith, we know that even in the darkest moments, God's light continues to be revealed in the world. And I believe that like that rock in the cave wall, that we reveal and reflect this light into the darkness of the world, just as others reveal God's light in our darkness, in our lives. So we have a job to do, my friends. We have a job. There's a reason why John's gospel gives a shout out to John the Baptist in verses 6 and 8. We read his story, his, his claim to fame, if you will, is being a witness to that light, standing in the midst of despair and hopelessness and pointing to Christ, facing fear and understanding and illuminating the world around him with what he knew about God's activity in the world and God's love. And that's our job as well, perhaps our New Year's resolution, to witness to the darkness and pain and despair of the world and, and to witness to God's power and God's compassion and God's presence in the midst of those very situations. When Russia began its initial strikes on Ukraine, Mikhailo Panochko, a senior bishop at the Ukrainian Evangelical Church, sent out a message to his community there in Ukraine. He says, we cannot change the situation in Ukraine, but we can change the situation in our hearts. What things do we need to keep peace? Well, there are two. First, trust in God that not a hair will fall from your head without him knowing. And second, God has given us a weapon of warfare the right to come to God in prayer. Then we can have a different worldview on what's happening because we are believers. We have someone to put our hope in. We have someone to turn to. We fully believe that everything, even the future of the church, is in God's hands. Our refuge is in God. The most important thing is to trust Him. Do not let your fear dwell in your heart. What hope, what faithfulness, what light in the midst of very real and literal darkness. Friends, as we begin this new year, whatever lies ahead of us, let us take heart. Let us marvel at the witness of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, and let us be witnesses ourselves, witnesses to the fact that God provides light and that the darkness cannot, cannot overcome it a tiny beam of light at times, only discernible by faith. Like the stone of the cave wall, may our faith retain and reflect that light that first shone on us. Because of that glimmer, may we trust that the power of darkness cannot prevail. This new year, may we be a people who believe in light in spite of darkness. And may we cast our glow of hope into the darkness of the world. 
With this faith and belief, I can wish you a happy new year and a prosperous 2023. Well, Bishop Pinocchio uh, ended his Christmas message quoting Psalm 33, and I think it's fitting, a fitting way to uh, begin our new year as well. Psalm 33 reads, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let our steadfast love, O Lord, or sorry, let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we place our hope in you. May this be so in your lives, in the lives of your family, in the life of this congregation, and in the life of the church. Amen.